Hi, Jamie. <laughs> Hi, Flossie. How are you doing? Very, very good. Excited. Awesome. I'm excited too. Um, hi to everyone watching. Thank you for tuning in for Jamie's webinar. Um, Jamie is the founder of the Thailand Manta Project. So Sue's going to be talking all about the mantas of the Thai Andaman Sea today, which is very exciting. Um, but she's also worked in the Maldives quite a lot. So maybe she'll have some interesting stories from the Maldives as well. Um, if you haven't watched one of our webinars before, I'll just tell you the technical information. So this talk will last about 20 minutes and then we will take questions from the audience. So as audience members, you are automatically muted and your video is switched off, but we would love to hear from you. So please put any questions or comments at any time in the Q&A box, which is on the Zoom toolbar. Um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can at the end of the talk. Um, the webinars from now onwards will be registration only. Um, so if you want to register for future webinars, just head to the website and you just have to type in your email address um, and your name, I think. So it's pretty easy. Um, and you all managed to do it for today's, so that should be fine. But yeah, I'll pass you over to Jamie now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Flossie. So I shall share my screen. Okay, Ashley, is it working? One second, I need to go back <laughs> to the beginning. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. I can hear some nice wind chimes in the background. Oh, yes. <laughs> Welcome to the tropic. Sorry. Very nice. Uh, I am quite new at this. Uh -huh. No rush. Perfect. Okay. Yay. Um, so thank you everyone, first of all, for tuning in and joining me today uh, in a different part of the world. It is a little bit a weird time that we are living in and uh, this webinar thing is, uh, I guess, bringing us a little bit closer and I hope you enjoy my talk today. Uh, which is going to be about the manta rays of the Thai Andaman Sea. Before we get there, first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Jamie. Uh, I'm originally from Bangkok, Thailand, uh, but I've been living down south for quite a while now because that's where the ocean is. And uh, basically, I'm based now in Koh Lanta, a small island of uh, Krabi in Thailand. Uh, how did I get involved with the Manta Trust, you might be wondering. Um, my story might be a little bit different from the rest of the team here at the Manta Trust, as I know and of. I uh, don't think anyone has joined the Manta Trust uh, through the beauty pageant. Um, I was actually uh, joining the, a beauty pageant called Miss Scuba International back in 2012. And um, I ended up winning that pageant as well. Uh, it was in Bali and during the competition, basically this is a pageant that are looking for uh, a woman or a girl, I like to say, to advocate and being the voice of the ocean, uh, being the voice of marine conservation, as well as scuba diving as a sport. Uh, and they chose me for that year. During this pageant, I got to hear about the um, manta rays from the Manta Trust which is actually by uh, Sarah Lewis. Hi, Sarah, if you're watching. Um, yeah, so I, I heard the presentation about the manta rays from Sarah, and uh, it was really, really touching for me because uh, I didn't really know much about the manta rays. It so they sounded amazing and, and very charismatic, but then it got to the sad part that they were threatened. Uh, and they were actually being fished out of the water, which back then I, I had no clue that this was going on. And I thought to myself, if I, as a person who's already into marine conservation, don't know any, uh, don't know about this, imagine how many people out there who have no idea that this is going on and that these guys are in great danger. So as back then, I vowed to myself to do whatever I can to protect these species. And uh, basically, after I won Miss Scuba pageant, I spent one year traveling the world, met a lot of great scientists, great people, divers, photographers. 
And uh, in 2014, I actually became a dive instructor. And I also applied for a volunteer position in the Maldivian Manta Ray Project at the Maldivian Manta Ray Project in the Maldives, which you can see in the picture here with all the great people. You have Annie and Neve there, as you might have seen in the um, previous webinars. So I spent three months in Ba Atoll, the famous home of the Hanifaru Bay. And uh, basically six days a week, we go out on our research boat. Uh, and I got to swim with the mantas um, basically every day and learn from the wild animal itself. And I have great um, scientists who help me and teach me a lot about these uh, species. So at the end of my three months, uh, with the, the, so much knowledge about these species and the capability, because I was going to move down south, I decided to start the Thailand Mental Project in 2015, and the rest is history. So first of all, before we get to the mantas, um, let's know a little bit about the country, Thailand. Uh, or people also call us as the land of smiles. As you can see here in the picture, uh, we have famous food, as you know, the Pad Thai, Tom Yam Kung, and uh, yeah, it is one of the top destinations in Southeast Asia. Uh, we have the population of around 69.8 million people living in this beautiful country that for Thai people, we call us, uh, we call ourselves the golden axe because if you look at the shape, it's actually shaped like the X, okay? And uh, with this golden X, we are divided into 76 uh, provinces in six regions. We have the north, the south, um, the west, the east, yellow here, tiny, northeast and central. And of course, for us, the majority uh, of our work is down the southern region in red here. And if you look here, you can see that we are really blessed with uh, the sea in both of the coast. Uh, on the east side, we have the Gulf of Thailand, which is part of the South China Sea. And on the west side, we have the beautiful Andaman Sea, okay? So for the Andaman Sea, it's basically the uh, marginal sea of the Eastern Indian Ocean. We are on basically on the most um, easternmost of the Indian Ocean here. It covers the ground of many, many countries, uh, including India, Myanmar, Malaysia, Indonesia, and of course, Thailand on this side. And this is basically where I am based around here at the moment as well. For the manta populations that we are seeing in Thailand, um, we're really lucky. We have the giant ones. We have the giant oceanic manta rays. Uh, and the manta season in Thailand are basically starting from October until April. Uh, for those of you who have joined the webinar before, you might, be already, uh, you might already know how to distinguish between the reef and the oceanic mantas. Uh, in case you are new, uh, let me remind you and have a little quick recap here, okay? So, uh, for the oceanic manta rays, if you look on the dorsal or the top side here, um, you can see distinguish between the shading of the white and the black. The shading is formed like an upside down letter T for the oceanic manta rays. And if you look at the base of the dorsal fin, you also find a lump of flesh there, which is a resemblance to the where the sting barb used to be for the stingrays. But manta rays do not have the sting barb anymore, so um, they are not danger to you. Don't have to be afraid of them, okay? They do not kill the crocodile hunter. Uh, if you are diving most of the time, you might be seeing the, doors, uh, the ventral side or the belly side of the mantas. The oceanic manta rays, they have quite clean chest area here all between the gills uh, and the pattern starts on the belly as well as they have more uh, permanent darker shading on the pectoral wings and inside of the cephalic fins or the mouth here okay and of course the habitat uh, they live more in the uh, they more have a more pelagic lifestyle and uh, they are more adventurous and here's a, actually a video of the oceanic manta rays that I personally saw who came, uh, it's a video from 
uh, one of the sighting locations in the Andaman Sea up in the north, called Kobon. Uh, and as you can see, all the shading is very curious. Uh, basically, I was coming up to my safety stop and uh, I was with my group and this Oceanic Manta was just so curious about us and came and showed the belly, so telling us who he is. Okay, so um, why do we see the manta rays in Thailand? Uh, most of the site, uh, the locations that we are seeing them, they are served as manta's cleaning stations. So the cleaning station is basically a place where the underwater coral reefs fill with these guys, the blue streak cleaner rasses or cleaner fishes. Uh, we are waiting there for the bigger animals to come and um, getting clean. If you look in the video, it looks very um, serene and they are having their spa time. Um, basically, when the manta need, feel a little bit dirty, they go to the cleaning station or if they have injuries, they go to the cleaning station and these rasses will go right in and do their job. The rasses get fed and the mantas get clean. Uh, we actually do not know where the mantas in Thailand go to feed. Uh, there is no record or sightings of the mantas feeding in Thailand yet um, so far. So it is quite a, a mystery because sometimes we will see an individual hanging around in the same spots uh, for several days in a row, but we only seen them cleaning. We don't know where they are feeding, even though sometimes as well, there are a lot of um, nutrients in the water. They don't seem to be feeding uh, in the shallow. So, so far, I think they are maybe feeding, prefer to be feeding uh, down deeper. So for the manta populations in Thailand, there are basically two main populations. Uh, one in the North Andaman, as we call it here in Thailand. Uh, the North Andaman, as you can see in this square, or the line, uh, including all of those area, but the majority of the main sites would be Kobon and Kotashai. Sometimes you might see them coming down here in the part of the original Similan Islands as well. Uh, and for the South Andaman, most of the time you will be seeing them almost the southest of the south, which is Hindang Hinmuang, the underwater pinnacles. Uh, and sometimes they are seen in Russian oil as well. For the North Andaman, we're focusing, of course, on the Similan Islands. Um, many divers, top spots. If you've been there, you might know some of this information. If you're thinking of going there, here's some new information for you. Uh, originally, there are nine islands in the Similan Islands, which is basically um, the origin of its name. Similan came from the word uh, Sibilan in Malay language, and uh, it kind of becomes Similan. It means number, na uh, number nine. And later on in 1998, uh, they actually add Kobon and Kotashai into part of the Similan National Park. So now, Similan Islands actually have 11 islands instead of um, nine. Some part of the Similan Islands are, of course, closed for um, conservation, turtle nesting grounds, so you can't even visit them, which is pretty good. Um, and if you dive in the Similan before, some people might be quite shocked in some of the sites, like such as in Kobon, uh, of the, you might see quite a lot of gravels on the, in the shallow because that's actually the effect from the El Nino or the uh, reverse Indian Ocean dipoles which happened already in 2010. We're starting to see the re regrowing of the corals there but of course it's not what it used to be like. I've seen some videos of um, the Similan and especially Kobon uh, few decades ago and they filled with stagnant coral but after 2010 these were just gravel but the manta is still preferred site so a lot of people are still visiting Kobon uh, for the manta rays and of course there are more than that there are the, um, the the ridge that is going down deeper then you have more of the soft corals in that area as well 
So there are some signs of hope of um, regrowing of the coral there. Okay, if you are planning to come here, be careful on your date because they do close. Uh, usually they close every year from 16th uh, of May to 15th of October. So basically the national parks, uh, the marine parks on the west coast are kind of closed now uh, for visitors because of the monsoon season. And for the safety as well as we're letting the, the fish population regrow. So how come we can tell that there, uh, we distinguish the populations in Thailand as two main populations and not only one, is because the database that came in, which is mostly uh, via the citizen science, um, basically telling us that uh, is actually around 200 kilometers uh, between Kobon to um, Hindang Hingmuang, according to Google map. Um, of course, if you're traveling via, uh, via the sea, it's, it's different in nautical mile, but let's say it's around 200 kilometers, um, which so you might think that they could be the same population as well, but uh, so far we have seen uh, the number of the population, they stick to the area. So let's say the North Andaman population, you don't really see them coming down at all, except for one individual which we have a record of, uh, which is Ninja, uh, is actually the only black morph manta we have on our database as well. We mostly have chevron and other white mantas in Thailand. Um, which Ninja was seen back in 2008 and in Koban, and 2014 in Hindang Hingmuang, still it's not the same season, so I don't think that count, maybe Ninja is still deciding, but most of the uh, population, they already kind of prefer um, different areas, such as the North Andaman. Uh, Arun is actually one of our most cited mantas in Thailand, and he belongs to the North Andaman population. We've seen him a lot, and all the time we've been seeing him in Kobon. Um, and he's been cruising, cleaning, and of course, uh, there was a record as well that he was joining or um, was swimming with a group of mantas and what it looked and sound very much like uh, would be a mating train. So for this population of North Andaman, we have majority of the population are female and that uh, we have fewer males. We're still not sure why. <laughs> for the uh, South Andaman population, we're moving down south now. Um, basically, we have this Mukolanta National Park area, and it's different from the dive site in the North Andaman. The North Andaman, we mostly have um, the granite boulders and forms very big swim through and really nice for divers as well. For the South Andaman, the dive sites are mostly uh, the rocks itself, but the topography is from limestone. So uh, it creates a lot of caves and caverns, a lot more soft corals down in the South Andaman area, um, if you compare to the depth and the dive sites itself. And uh, again, we also close the, uh, these parts between 16th of May to 31st of October each year. So plan your trip well. If you would like to dive in Deng Muang and uh, don't come during this time, come a little bit after, okay? Uh, for the South Andaman population, is the contrast uh, or is different from this, the North Andaman, which majority were female. In the South Andaman, the majority were actually males more than females. So we're still not sure why is that, that is the reason, but we have had more reports or sightings of a mating train in the south more than the north so far. So that could be the reason why we have um, more of the males than the females in the south. Okay, and, um, but I'm giving you the example of one of the most cited female we've seen in South Andaman, uh, which is Popo. Uh, so Popo was first seen in 2014, and the last time that we have record of her was in 2016, uh, which I was actually there myself. You can see the pink fin there, that's me. 
And the picture was taken by my photographer friend, uh, Magnus, who lives here on the island as well. So if you notice here, this is small, small bump. It's quite difficult to see, but because I was able to be there myself as well, and she was hanging around for the whole dive, for the whole one hour or so, um, she was the first recorded uh, pregnant female in our um, database in Thailand. So it is very in, uh, exciting indeed to find out that there are some pregnant females coming around uh, in, in Thailand as well. And uh, it, will this information gives you, uh, this sighting give you more information maybe because she was actually seen in 2014 uh, as part of the mating train and in 2016 she was recorded being pregnant. Um, as Neve was already uh, saying on his the, the previous webinar about reproduction, I'm not sure if they can hold a sperm that long, but maybe, and it was quite an early pregnancy as well. So a lot, a lot of mystery we still need to find out for the manta population in Thailand. So come to a little bit to the sad side of the story, of course. Um, we do see quite a lot of injuries in the manta population or in the mantas individuals in Thailand. Um, and there are quite a lot of uh, a few reasons and of threats uh, for the mantas in Thai waters as well as everywhere else in the world. Of course, first thing is the environmental change. Um, that is something that, of course, uh, we have to work together to help that. And there's also uh, the ghost nets by cash and tourism. So let's see something that um, a little bit more obvious to us. Uh, and you can see it right there. And then which is the ghost nets. Uh, basically, the ghost nets are the fishing gear that has been dis discarded or lost at sea and they just kind of drifting or sometimes even cover the whole uh, reef. And what happened is these guys, when uh, these, um, the fishes, when they are swimming, especially the big pelagic fishes like the mantas or the whale sharks, uh, they cannot, the mantas, they cannot swim backwards. So once they swim into these uh, ghost nets, they basically got caught either in the cephalic fins or on the uh, pectoral fins. And um, the more they swim, or sometimes they tend to be, uh, be barrel rolling or like belly roll, um, it ends up being tighter and tighter. And it might cut off part of their body, such as this one is missing the left top tip of the left pectoral fins. And this manta here was in Kobon. So this one was from, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, the manta picture is actually from uh, Hindang and the video is from Kobon. Uh, the manta in Kobon, if you notice on the cephalic, the right cephalic, it's actually kind of dangle already. And it could be from both collision as well. But then I have a look at this video and if you look at the dorsal fin on the back, it's actually cut through the dorsal fins and there are um, a little bit more of the uh, sign of nets, like right there. So yeah, ghost nets ha is quite a big problem for the manta population here in Thailand. And we just come in almost hand, hand in hand. When you have the ghost nets, of course, you have a lot of uh, fishing activities in your area. Um, then you potentially could have bycatch as well. Uh, in Thailand, we don't really target the manta rays uh, or the mobile rays, maybe because we don't have such a big population as well, which I don't know if that's a good thing. Uh, but of course, the more of them in the water, that's always a good, good news, right? So bycatch is basically an accidental caught species. It's not just mantas, it's all the living creatures in the ocean, you can say, are now categorized as bycatch in the ocean. This caused by the um, wrong method of fishing or the use, wrong use uh, of the gear, wrong choice of gear, uh, unsustainable way to fish. And that's why it kind of, when you eat seafood, you have to really, really be careful, which I'm getting about. Uh, I'm gonna get more into it a little bit later. 
So yeah, uh, we do have a lot of uh, fishermen and fishing boats in, in Thailand and uh, the regulation is become stricter and stricter, but occasionally we do see a bycatch problem in Thailand as well. And our neighbor as well, we have seen a lot of photos and records uh, of landing of mobile arrays. So that is quite worrying because we do think there is a potential that maybe it is the same species, uh, it is the same population of manta rays, uh, a little bit in our neighbor in Myanmar and the north of the, the North Andaman population, which require more further investigation and study, of course. But yeah, if they travel that along that area with the heavy fishing, it could be really, really dangerous for them. How can you help? Uh, it's, really simple for such a big and dreadful problem uh, is basically know where your fish come from. And to know where your fish come from is not as hard as you might have thought. Basically, you need to develop a new habit of asking a new question, uh, which is where does this fish come from? Uh, do the seller know? Does the shop know? What species of fish is it? Uh, and then, before that, of course, you can educate yourself and choose the sustainable fish to eat. And thanks to the technology nowadays, you can actually download an application uh, such as Seafood Watch, which is one of my favorites, to um, have it on your phone. If you travel a lot, you can choose the destination and they will give you the list of which fish is sustainable to eat, uh, which is in the green, of course, the yellow is think twice so if you have the choice of the green list don't go to the yellow list and of course the red list is is the definitely no no they're in danger in the area so don't even think about trying it okay if you love the ocean it's quite simple to fix this problem and everyone can do it and it starts from every meal that we eat and we ask more questions and i think we can do it we can help making this better the next problem that we have been seeing for the manta population in Thailand is also tourism. Of course, with tourism, it affects the environment, but that's not the only thing because we have um, ecotourism, which basically in Thailand, uh, we are the second uh, most popular destination people choose to come dive with manta rays in Southeast Asia. So there are a lot of divers want to come dive with manta rays in Thailand. Uh, but if we have too many people in the water at the same time and they don't behave correctly, then that could be quite a, a mess, I would say. And we have been seeing that as well, <laughs> sometimes. So the government do try, does try to do something here in Thailand, such as in the Similan National Park, where, uh, which is home to the North Andaman population. Uh, they have put on a visitor cap uh, since 2018 to only 3,850 a day, which to some of you, you might think that it is uh, still quite a lot, but most of those are actually for snugglers. And for divers, 525 people uh, a day. So that actually reduced a lot. And at the beginning, it was quite a big problem with organization. But I think we're getting used to it and we're, we're with better plan from the Hey, you just that? disappeared for a sec. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where did you lose me? <laughs> um, talking about tourism, but it was going okay. smoothly until then. Okay, all right. So I'm going to Love start that. a little bit again. Did you get to the cap of the, the similar? Um, I don't know. I can't remember what was on it before. It okay, no off. problem. I'll, I'll start again. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Sorry about that. Um, island connection as well. Um, okay, so I'm not sure where you lost me, 
but basically tourism is really big in Thailand, including ecotourism. And uh, a lot of people want to come and dive with the manta rays in Thailand, which is why the government have came up with the new cap, which we started using in uh, 2018. Basically, as you can see the number here on the screen, uh, there is only 525 divers a day covering quite a big area. As you learn, uh, as we learn now that it's about 70 square meters, um, square kilometers that covers the uh, Simila National Park area. And that is for 525 divers um, a day. But even though there is a cap, even though there is only a few of you in the water, if you don't behave when you're in the water with the fishes and especially the pelagic animal, it's not going to be sustainable, right? So we need to behave ourselves as well. We need to respect the animal. We need to respect the environment. We are visitors and I'm sure most of you here, you love the ocean and you're already doing that. If you're a professional, you need to uh, lead by example. So be a good example, behave nicely when you see these guys. Don't go chasing them. Sometimes it's really, um, piss me off really when I see the guys start chasing the mantas or chasing the whale shark because then of course your guests are going to follow you. So please, um, please behave yourself and educate yourself so then you can um, spread the education to your guests as well because I'm sure a lot of people that go and want to swim with these guys, they have good intention. They do not want to hurt the animal to start with. So when you behave correctly, we can have uh, a sustainable relationship between divers, snorkelers with these big animals. So I'm coming towards the end of, uh, towards the end of my presentation, bringing in a little bit of Reiki vibe into the scene. Um, this is a short video I made about our project uh, at the beginning of the season this year, and it's basically what I do. So this is um, what I make for Polanta. We do weekly the uh, Manta trip to Hindang Hinmuang, where I go on board and give the presentation to divers. Of course, uh, it helped educating them and um, hopefully we can behave and interact the right way when we see these guys who are in the water. And sometimes we do see them and we have happy divers. Okay. Uh, apart from doing that, uh, what else are we doing for Thailand Mentor Project? So since 2015, we have basically established um, a national database of the manta rays. Altogether, we have over currently over 200 individuals in our database. I expect there's a lot more, uh, but of course we need the data. And the tool that we have been using are basically the photo ID. So it's a citizen science based, uh, which you can help us to find out together uh, about the Thai manta population. And of course, we're doing uh, our manta expeditions as well, as you can see here on this picture. Uh, so far, we've done with the junk and the penisi, very lovely boat. And basically, we're doing the diving trip, the educational dive trip. Each day, you would have the uh, educational presentation about manta ray, marine conservation, and the area itself as well, which is a dive trip to make a difference and uh, together we hope that you can help us spread the awareness to more and more people and to your dive buddies okay and uh, we have been collaborated with the department of fisheries and department of marine coastal resources in thailand and one of the things that we're mostly proud of is um, when we started in 2015 the mantas are basically uh, unprotected in thailand and it is quite dangerous for them um, even though we don't have the targeted fish for manta rays here, but since if they're not protected, it also doesn't really, um, it, it's easily could, you know, if the fishermen see the manta rays, they might just kill them because they know that the gills were something. 
But uh, with the work from a lot, a lot of sectors and people, uh, we were also helping providing the database of our Manta. And uh, after three years of waiting, finally in 2018, uh, in September, the mantis, uh, actually all mobula species that were sighted in Thai waters were added to the National Protected Species List. Uh, we might have been a small part in that, but you know, it shows that when we do work together um, with collaboration from starting from the divers themselves, because we cannot have the database without you guys, without your help. Uh, we would not have enough information, enough data to show to the government that these species worth protecting. So yeah, thank you so much for um, those of you who have been helping us over the years, maybe uh, not only through uh, data, but by supporting our merchandise, joining our uh, expeditions, it, it really means a lot. And that's how our project could exist until today. And uh, we are growing and we're planning to be here for a long time because the mantas are also still here. There's still a lot we don't know though. As mentioned, we don't even know what these guys are feeding. And there are still threats, even though they are now protected species. Um, the, we need to make it more sustainable because we have been seeing a lot of decline in sightings of the mental population in Thailand. Uh, it could be many reasons why, but yeah, we need to study and go through this together. So with your help, we can make it happen. Uh, and right now, the last season, I'm sure there were a lot of manta sightings, especially in the North Andaman. It was really quiet in the South Andaman. So if you're watching and you are working in Thailand in the diving industry or if you're a diver yourself and you have, uh, you were lucky enough to see these animals, uh, share with us your experience. How did it go? And please, if you have the, um, Manta ID shot like this one, for example. We need the photo or video, video that can see or show us the uh, belly spot pattern. If you can get the pelvic fins as well, it would be perfect because then we can identify which gender they are. Uh, you can send us directly to me if it's the mantas in Thailand or simply go to mantatrust.org slash ID the manta if they are from other places in the world because as you know by now the manta trust has many many projects and we do work together so yeah um we need all the help any way that you can and especially in this time um we really really appreciate it and i hope you uh get to learn about the the Thai manta rays and as well as thailand and uh we hope to welcome you one day in in the Thai waters in Koh Lanta. If you want to keep in touch, <laughs> just before I go, I forgot. Uh, we have the Facebook and Instagram page, Thailand Mentor Project. If you would like to have a chat with me personally or ask me a question, I'm more than happy to uh, chat with you. And you can reach me at Jamie Miskuba at both uh, Facebook and Instagram as well. So thank you so much, Manta Trust, for having this webinar and bringing us together, even though we are like across the globe. <laughs> thank you, Jamie. It's really nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you, Flossie. Thank you. That was super informative. And I love that you have a mantle called Pawpaw. Did you know about the Maldivian mantle called Pawpaw? Pawpaw, I saw when I was going through the database. Yeah. yeah. So they, she or he, I don't know if it's a she or he, but they've traveled between five atolls, I think, in the Maldives. So she really? or he is quite a famous manta, but I, I don't think I've ever personally seen them. Um, Wait a minute, maybe that's where the name Popo came from, actually, when I came back from Maldives. Yeah, does maybe. Popo have similar, similar, like a three dots. Yeah, I think she does, and two are kind of connected. Or yeah, he. yeah, I think that's why I named this one Popo, because oh, so when cool. I came back, I saw this, I'm like, that reminded me of Popo. <laughs> oh, okay, that's awesome. Um, okay, cool. Well, firstly, I'm just going to ask you a bit about your personal experiences in the water in Thailand and the Maldives, because obviously they're very different, but have you got some yeah. favorite, favorite experiences from either or both? Um, yes, both. Uh, well, Maldives was, that was where I first 
that I saw my first manta rays. Well, like in in Hanifara Bay, and that was yeah. the first day. And I remember the experience so vividly. It was like we were going into the bay, and Guy Stevens was there as well. Mm -hmm. And Guy was like kind of shouted with the boat that was already there the numbers like 30 40 and i'm like so casual talking <laughs> about you know like very casual and i'm like like yeah the 40 mantas here i'm like what <laughs> and i've never seen any so i didn't really know how to like behave like what to do you know like you knew what you should be doing but when you're in the water with them for the first time yeah. with that many i'm like what am i supposed to do uh yeah but the first one and they came right underneath me and you know i tried to be as like arch my back up as much yeah. as possible but they were just like you know like eating and didn't really care um but actually the most memorable one in the maldives was my favorite uh, manta sandy i'm okay. not sure i don't know sandy, sandy. Yeah. i think sandy hasn't been seen for a while oh. which is kind of worrying <laughs> but um She's, she's been pregnant like twice already. And when I saw her, she was quite like, you can see the bulge pretty clearly. So she was quite heavily pregnant as well. Uh, that was the first manta I observed as a pregnant manta. So I kind of have that bond with her. And then yeah. I've seen her again a few times and she kind of, she's really like, really relaxed, really chill. And it was at the cleaning station. So like I had like, I observed her a lot. Uh, I just somehow grew fond of her. I can recognize her from the top, from her like mating scars and everything, you know. Like, yeah. um, and then it was the last day. I was uh, I was on Manta on call, so I was at the base. And then um, yeah, they they call us, and then we went with the guest. Uh, and jumping in the water was my last day in the water before I come back to Thailand. So it was kind of sad. Uh, and I was thinking like Annie was there on the boat as well. And I was saying to Annie, like, it would be so cool if Sandy could like, would be here, you know? Yeah. And then jump in the water. And then we were waiting for a while at the cleaning station in Darabandu. And uh, yeah, there was actually like no mantis. <laughs> so you're we waiting a little bit. Uh, and then like a group of mantis starts swimming towards us, uh, towards the cleaning station. We were on top. And then there was a female leading it. And then I'm like, whoa, she looks so fierce. You know, she gives the fierce energy and all that. I'm like, and then I'm like, I look at her and then I recognized her. I'm like, oh my God, is that Sandy? I was not sure. And then, so I had a chance to like dive down at the bombing nearby. I was just waiting and waiting. And then she came my way and like uh, just swam across me i looked up and it was sandy oh so, and came and said hi you know like from like the main cleaning station area i was on the side and just waiting yeah. and then she just actually came above my head really close and uh yeah that was like i got to say bye to sandy um That's and so that funny. was like really really touching and yeah. it's amazing how we kind of each have our favorite manta. <laughs> Definitely. I think I have a few now. I can't pick between them all. Yeah. Which one are yours? I love turtles. She's a big female and she's always barrel rolling or some sort of feeding right underneath you. But we didn't see her last year, not once. So Ooh. hopefully she's okay. Hopefully she'll be back this year. Um, mm. But the year okay. before, I have all this, these videos of her every day almost that there was mantas in the bay and she's just like right there she's so bold yeah. she's so confident and sassy yeah it's <laughs> fun it's really nice um actually with the mantis do we have time am i am i battling too much <laughs> no, no, we've got some time um yeah with the mantis in the in thailand it was actually not such a happy story um it was after i came back from the maldives and started the project i was also working as a i am actually still working as well as dive instructor mm -hmm. so uh we went on the, a place in russia Noi, which is actually part of um dive size from phuket i was living in phuket at the time and um yeah we do have some sightings there but it's not as much as uh in similan or in Benghimol. um 
so that day it was after two dives already and we were just wait during surf this interval we were in the bay and uh you know every day the boat boys would just tease me they would just keep shouting manta mantas because they know how crazy i am about mantas and there were no mantas and that day i could hear it was like intense so i'm like i look over and there was manta and like within less than a minute i was in there with fins and snorkel yeah and um yeah there was a manta and the first like i was so excited because that was my first manta in thailand and my first oceanic manta ever you know, so I was so like full of excitement. I'm like, finally, I'm gonna see my first oceanic. And I looked down, and this manta was actually having a, a rope oh. tied on to her tail, and another one on her cephalic fin. Oh. So I instantly looked up. I just yelled, like, somebody bring a knife down. And uh, my instructor, she came down. Another instructor, she came down later. And she came with a knife and she like duck dive down and um you know she was kind of too far and i was like i don't know i don't have a knife with me but i just need to see if i can help yeah so you know with i have to like i'm not sure if i'm being biased but like with the experience we have as well in the maldives swimming and snorkeling tree diving with manta rays you know you kind of become more calm yeah uh, and learn how to approach the mantas that you don't frighten them you know like or the least as possible so we went i went down and i just to look if there's anything i could do and uh it was actually a knot you know it's a loop not even a knot it was a loop okay so and you know it was kind of probably less than a minute but in my head it was so like euphoria you know like i look at it and I just found myself already watching my hand like wow. loosen the loop and hold on to the rope and the manta was gone. So I actually like I um, untied the rope at her tail, okay. um, which was quite like there, there was a, lo a line uh, facing it. So I'm like, oh my God, I came up and everyone was cheering above the water because I was actually, I took off the rope and it was so nice, you know, but um, then there was this uh, loop, another like knot tied onto her cephalic. Yeah. And from the look of it is she was caught, you and, know, and it, yeah, it was and she like, swam away. Someone cut, yeah, someone cut the rope loose. So, you know, um, it was really sad to to know to have that kind of uh, acknowledged that you know we thought i thought that there's no target fish for mantas here but there are some part or there are some people that are still doing it when they see one which i could understand it could be poor fishermen you know they got to do something to survive but that, back then there was also no protection to manta rays either okay so it's more attractive to them but yeah i had the rope i try again to get the the one in the cephalic but it was too close to the eyes and it was really like no trace so i didn't get that one uh that manta was end up circle around uh for the whole surface interval oh. we went to dive after and we couldn't see her and later on i like after that was very fresh when i was an instructor in Phuket. that was the first year mm -hmm. and i was there for four years and I've never had an experience of a mantis coming into the bay and circle around the boat like that. Wow, so maybe she wanted help. Yeah, maybe she heard the boat mm. or something, you know, and she was like, she came and, and then, yeah, asked for help or something. So that was, that was my first oceanic spray so mantis. <laughs> Your first experience with an oceanic. And I got bent after that. Well, well done for letting the rope <laughs> tail. Thank you. Have you ever seen her since? No. Mm, I named her Sandy. Sandy? Yeah, yeah, I went down and got her ID. So like, of oh, course, yeah. I miss Sandy so much. I'm like, well, we needed Sandy in Thailand. <laughs> I hope that you see her again one day. I hope so too. <laughs> okay, cool. We have a question here from Louis. Louis has asked, what is um, the place of environment in Thai policy? So what's the environmental policy in Thailand? Um, it is getting better and better. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the government are trying to do a lot more in the recent, I would say five years since we started the project, we've seen the positive change 
uh, from everyone, from the fisheries themselves as well. They've strictened the law for um, the fishing vessels. And also from the people who are working to conserve it, they are um, coming up with the stricter regulation. If you, you might have heard that Maya Bay, where they filmed the beach, is um, close to further notice, you know? Like it's been closed for uh, the last season as well, which is a big thing because it brought a lot of money to the, the people in the area. Uh, same with the cap that they put on the, the similar islands as well. So it is going to the positive side, I would say, as well as um, I can see from the public uh, itself, like, I guess, because of the social media and how we share the information nowadays, people are more um, aware of what is going on. And possibly because diving has, scuba diving has become such a popular sport uh, for, for the Thai people as well. Um, and, you know, ocean lovers, we kind of, a little bit, like you have to be a bit environmentalist when you, are, uh, when you see all this happening, you know, to the reef, to the ocean, to the plastic pollution that we see. So uh, it is heading to a, a brighter future, I would say. Um, sometimes it might take slow, but uh, it might take a long time and a little bit slow, but at least there's hope there. Yeah. It sounds like they're on the right track, maybe. Um, yeah. And I went to um, Maya Bay actually years ago before it was yeah. a band and it was nice, but there were so many people um, and I was obviously one of them, so I wasn't innocent, but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's so good that they're starting to protect some of these areas. Yeah, and there are loads of, because um, around there when you dive, uh, there's some dive site just outside of Maya Bay, mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, I forgot the name, Shark Point, no, Shark Rock, something with shark. <laughs> and you can see the, the black tip reef sharks. Yeah. in that area as well and even on pp itself there are some spots that you can just snorkel and you would see like wow. 20 30 black tip reef sharks it's babies but it's nice to see and now they're starting to see them coming back like even to the beach area because now there's no disturbance from boats or people you know and at the same time people are trying to uh regrow the corals in the area as well so yeah, very, very uh, good news for Thailand to see and uh, seeing not only the government, but also a lot of volunteers in the nice. private sector coming, you know, kind of collaborate. That's awesome. I want to see more of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we better move on to our last question. Um, so this is one we've been asking everyone about what their favorite uh, book about the natural world would be. So what would yours be? I know it's like, <laughs> it might sound like uh, really cheesy, but it's actually this book. I have it next to me at all times. I love it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's uh, The Guide to Manta and Devil Race of the World. Uh, it's by, of course, um, our founder as well, the Guy Stevens, uh, Daniel Fernando, Mark Fando, and I cannot pronounce his name. We said? <laughs> I also struggle, but he's an amazing person. <laughs> Thank <you>. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys. Like um the reason it is my favorite book about natural world is kind of it makes me, you know, I know a lot already about the mantas and mobile arrays, but this is really detailed and um it kind of made me become more confident as well as I read it, you know, it's like confirms the facts that I already know and enlightened me with the new things that I have no idea and, but seeing, and, you know, I thought in my head, like, is, is that why? And then you read it. I'm like, Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, like that that's why. Sense. Yeah. That's and so yeah, useful for us for the um, devil ray ident yeah. identification as well. Definitely. Um, if you love the mobile arrays, manta rays, I really recommend this book. I don't get any commission from Manta Trust. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, from my heart, this is uh, what I, well, I have it right next to me when I work as well. Okay. And, and flip through it. And it's, it's really informative. 
Yeah, and agreed. Maybe another one is the, the secret life of the manta rays. <laughs> That's a good coffee yeah. table one. Yeah, very, very big book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but definitely this one, I, I really enjoy reading it. it uh, teach, teaches me a lot about the mobile arrays mm -hmm. and I already love them. So it's nice to, you know, keep educating myself and um, so I can spread some knowledge and awareness. Yeah, about as well. keep learning more. Okay, yeah, exactly. cool. Thank you, Jamie. That was amazing. And um, I'm so glad that we could all learn more about the Thai mantas um, and some of your oh, yeah. experiences. I do we have more information, but um, we, uh, we do struggle with getting the data yeah. as well. You know, like, uh, I know there are a bigger population out there. The, the number of the population is not 200 individuals that we have been seeing, but so far this is what we received. So yeah, hopefully um, if people are watching this or, you know, uh, your friends have been diving in Thailand, uh, you could help us, you know, send, send through the, the photos and videos, even though sometimes, you know, you can't really identify them but it's nice to see is we also still record you know that there are mentors there as a sighting um so yeah your photos and video could really um help us fix the the jigsaw puzzle we are trying to solve here and the more information the more we can protect these guys the better yeah definitely hopefully we have some budding citizen scientists watching i'm sure we do yeah. Okay, cool. So thanks, Jamie. And thanks to everyone, as always, for watching. Um, we have a couple more webinars coming up this week. We have one on Wednesday with Marisol, who's going to be talking about coral reefs. So something a little bit different. Um, that is at 4pm BST. And then we have one on Friday with Bex Carter. She's our director of operations. And that one is at 3pm. And she's going to be talking about um, how you can support mantas and get involved with manta conservation. So that's going to be a really cool one. Um, as always, you can find out more about our webinars and manta rays and devil rays on our website and our social media pages. Um, and at this strange time, you can help us support our affiliate projects um, by donating to our emergency GoFundMe page. You can find this on the webinars page of the website. So that's mantatrust.org slash webinars. And any money that you donate will go towards helping support um, the smaller projects around the world to keep going with their research and conservation. Um, okay, hopefully see you guys on Wednesday. And thanks again, Jamie. Thank you, Flossie. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Stay safe. <laughs> Bye.